Thank you for coming tonight to this uh, beautiful venue and thanks to uh, Dar Tafel for hosting us. We're really happy to be here uh, close to these rooms and to this nice exhibition. I invite you to have a look at the Palestine Heritage Museum or perhaps to come back when there's more time in your hand to have a look at uh, what's on display. We take special pride in this venue and we're really very happy uh, for the bookshop to be partnering with Dar Tafel Arabi today in this event. Now, for three years, Penn has been traveling around Palestine cities and villages, witnessing the hardship of their lives, yet also observing the way in which people cultivate hope in daily paces. And I'm here borrowing the late Mahmoud Darwish words. The Way to the Spring, Life and Death in Palestine is a powerful, beautiful volume to read, full of details, informative, well-researched, well and written in a joyful, novelistic style. Ben Ehrenresh is an author of two novels, Ether and the Suitors. His writing has appeared in the Harbors, the New York Times Magazine, and the London Review of Books, among other publications. He's a recipient of the National Magazine Award, and he lives currently in Los Angeles. I must say that Ben is one of the very few journalists who define their rule beyond the pseudo-objectivity in journalism. I'm, hoping, I'm helping myself by reading what he wrote in the introduction of his book, and no one is neutral here, not anywhere, but especially not in Palestine. I do not aspire in these pages to objectivity. I don't believe it is to be a virtue or even a possibility. We are all of us subjects stuck fast to bodies, places, histories, and points of view. I aspire here, he is adding, to something more modest than objectivity, which is truth. It is a slippery creature an elusive one that lived most of the time in contradiction. I'm very honored to welcome Ben this evening, and I'm proud to promote his work. This is a book about Palestine, freedom and occupation, hope and despair, justice and injustice. This book is, as Adam Schatz described it, a freedom song burning with humanity. I will ask Ben to speak about the book for 20, 25 minutes and then we'll take your questions. Again, thank you for coming, and I wish you a very informative and a very good discussion. Thanks. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mahmoud, for that uh, introduction and for organizing this, um, and for being here, and thanks to the Palestine Heritage Museum and to the Dar al Tafel Arabi organization um, for allowing us to have in this beautiful space, and thank you all um, for coming out. Um, I first came to Palestine as a journalist in 2011. Um, at the time, I was working on a story about the role of water in the occupation. And I kept hearing um, about one little village that had started weekly protests um, to protest the loss of a spring um, just outside the village. Uh, which had been confiscated by settlers uh, who lived across the valley from them. The village was called Nabisala, I'm sure many of you have heard it, but many of you have probably been there. And um, the settlement is called Halamish. And I went one Friday to this village, not sure what I would find, and was really deeply moved by what I saw there. Um, some of you may have been to demonstrations in Nabisala, this was 2011, when they were still really kind of at their peak. and. Um, what impressed me was not just all of these people going out and marching together, uh, you know, men, women, children, old people, um, and not just people from the village, but people from surrounding villages at that time, uh, people from Ramallah at that time, um, people from Israel at that time, and people from other parts of the world who went to, to show their solidarity and to witness what was happening there. Um, and that day was a particularly dramatic um, demonstration. Um, if you've been to these demonstrations, you know that usually before the villagers get uh, really more than a couple hundred meters down the street, um, the Israeli military begins firing tear gas at them, and uh, things kind of go on from there. Um, that day was a particularly hectic one. Um, and since then, I've been to probably dozens of demonstrations um, but what struck me even then in the very beginning was that the people there 
um, we're making this very conscious choice to not let um, this confiscation of their land go without protest, um, to not just let it happen. Um, and what that choice meant was that every week, every Friday, um, the Israeli army came into the village shooting tear gas, filling the village with tear gas, often with skunk water, um, that people were injured almost every week, that people were arrested almost every week, that people had to pay bail almost every week, that people's homes were damaged and destroyed every week. Ultimately, it would mean that two young men from the village would be killed. Um, and that many of the young men from the village and some of the women would do lengthy terms in Israeli prisons. It also meant that during the week the army would come back um, and they would wake people up in the night, they would search houses, they would ransack houses, they would arrest people in the night. It meant that by resisting, people were welcoming um, an extraordinary amount of insecurity into their lives. And all they had to do to reduce that to the kind of baseline humiliation and security that Palestinians suffer in the West Bank and in Jerusalem was to stop, um, to stop demonstrating and going out every Friday. And week after week, they didn't stop. They kept going. And this eventually is what brought me back here um, because I wanted to understand what makes people keep fighting an opponent that is in every measurable way far stronger than they are who according to any rational calculus, they have no chance at all of beating. I want to understand that will to resist, what motivates and sustains it, and also ultimately what it costs people, um, because it costs a great deal. I didn't want to write a romantic book about Palestinian struggle. I think that, that book has been written, um, but a clear-eyed one, one that reckoned seriously not only with the hopes that motivate this kind of resistance, but also the despair with which those who engage in it must constantly grapple. And with the ways that hope and despair interact with one another. These questions ended up taking over my life. Uh, in June of 2013, I moved here um, and spent uh, a little bit more than a year living here um, and reporting not just from Nabi Saleh, but from, from Hebron and all over the West Bank. Um, and writing the book that I'm presenting to you today. Um, I knew throughout this that to do it well, I would have to write a different kind of book. I couldn't write the kind of book that is usually published about Palestine in the US. In the American media, the one demand we always hear when it comes to narratives about Palestine is for something called balance. Which is strange on the face of it, because the one thing that stands out to any honest observer of the situation here is its extraordinary imbalance. An imbalance of power, an imbalance of insecurity, an imbalance, certainly, of violence, an imbalance of access to resources, an imbalance of access to the rest of the world, and an imbalance, in the end, to the control over narrative, including the narratives told about one's own life. All of this is fairly obvious, immediately obvious, I think, and very painful to observe. It is what characterizes life here. The things are out of balance. This is why this place always feels on the verge of collapse. It always feels here like something is about to happen, like things are finally going to, going to reach some reckoning. Uh, that things are really finally going to fall down because things everyone knows are so profoundly out of balance. And it's very easy to believe here that this situation, because of this, can't be sustained, that this constant imbalance kind of can't go on any longer, um, that it must be unsustainable. And yet it does go on year after year. And one of the reasons I believe that it goes on, that such deep and apparently unsustainable injustice has been sustained for so very long is because of this narrative requirement that exists particularly in the United States, but I think in, in world media generally, in English language media, for this strange creature that we call balance. And what it means is that Palestinian narratives must always have a counterweight, an Israeli narrative that weighs as much as they do. We must always tell the other side of the story and the assumption is that the other side carries equal, if not greater, weight. 
What this means practically is that stories about Palestinian realities are considered incomplete unless they're accompanied by narratives about Israelis. And behind this is the same old conviction that Palestinians do not exist, that Palestine does not exist, that without Israelis, their existence is insubstantial and somehow false. Because no one in the US or in Europe or in Israel makes the same demand of narratives about Israel. Many books, articles, novels are written about Israeli life and published around the world, and no one so loudly demands that these stories be balanced with narratives about Palestinians. Israeli realities are somehow considered complete in themselves in a way that Palestinian realities never are. They don't need any supplement. In other words, the insistence on balance that we hear whenever Palestinian realities are represented is in fact a coded demand for imbalance. An insistence that the imbalance that in every respect characterizes the situation here be maintained at all costs. This is an extraordinary rhetorical trick. Because who could complain about something so harmless, so valuable as balance, right? But this is precisely how oppression and injustice are normalized. The demand for balance is it a way to sound very reasonable while pushing for the erasure of Palestinian realities and Palestinian lives. I strived in writing this very purposefully from the very beginning before I put a word to paper to write an imbalanced book, one that took Palestinian realities seriously, that didn't consider them incomplete or wanting. And I will leave it to you to judge if I did so with honesty and fairness and integrity and depth. One thing that was clear to me um, from the start was that to write a book about resistance also couldn't just mean writing about clashes and tear gas and funerals and prisons and courts. There's, there's enough of that in this. But it also had to mean writing about the joys and the love that sustained people. Um, that allowed them to keep fighting in a situation that seemed so unsustainable and so unwinnable. Um, so I'll read from a scene uh, from the book about a trip I took to the beach with the family of Bassem and Nariman Tamimi, um, who were some of the leaders of the movement in Nabi Saleh um, in the summer of 2013. Um, this requires a tiny bit of introduction, first of all, to the characters. I'm sure some of you know these people well. Um, but um, Bassem and Nariman, as I said, are among the leaders of the, the resistance in Nabi Saleh. They have three children. Um, the oldest of them is Wad, uh, who's now, um, I believe, 19 at the time of this, was 17, um, and uh, who was just released from prison a few weeks ago after serving um, the unfortunate rite of passage that so many young Palestinian men have to serve. Um, he served. 10 months in, in jail, and I'd seen him, because I hadn't seen him um, somebody a year before he was arrested, and have been uh, rather stunned at his transformation uh, into, a, into a young man over, over these months um, in a, a sort of university that people should not have to study in. Um, the next youngest uh, is Ahed Tamimi, um, the one girl in the family who has a uh, earned an unwelcome sort of celebrity. I'm sure some of you know her, her image and her name. Um, she became famous around the world um, a few years ago when her brother was arrested for the very first time and locked in the back of an Israeli jeep during a demonstration. And Ahid, if you see the video rather than the image alone, um, it's, a, it's extremely difficult to watch. Um, her brother had just been arrested. She just lost it, was screaming and completely distraught. And in her despair, she shook her fist um, in the face of an Israeli soldier demanding that he release her brother. And that one image went viral of this tiny blonde um, Palestinian girl standing up to this well-armed, helmeted soldier in body armor. Um, and she, she briefly became famous. Um, the next youngest kid is uh, Mohammed, better known as Abu Yazan, um, who also um, became famous just this last year when um, he was grabbed by an Israeli soldier um, outside the village 
and um, again, the video is, is very painful to watch, and he's terrified. The soldier is kind of holding him in a headlock. He had his uh, arm in a, in a cast from injury the previous week while he was running from soldiers. Um, and eventually, famously, this was all over the press here, um, his, his mother and his aunt and his cousins um, came out and kicked and tugged at and bit the soldier um, until the soldier eventually released him. And his image too, I was in, I was in London in, uh, in January and February and his image was all over the London Metro. Um, and so he too became uh, unwillingly through his, through what was surely a pretty traumatic moment, um, a symbol of, of Palestinian resistance and of the oppression that people suffer here. Um, uh, one thing I should say about Abiyaz, because he's sort of the protagonist of this, this little scene, is that he's, uh, he's an extremely smart, an extremely sensitive boy. Um, he's, he's the kid in the village who's kind of always in trouble. Um, whenever anything goes wrong in Nabi Saleh, you hear somebody yelling, Abu Yazan! Um, and usually it is in fact him. Um, like most very smart and sensitive kids with a lot of energy, he's uh, always up to something um, and asks a lot of very good questions. And the youngest kid, who only appears very briefly in this, this section, is called Salam. So with that said, I'll read. Uh, one other thing. Um, I assume this is known here. Um, it may not be. But um, one thing that really struck me on spending extended amounts of time here um, was the role the sea plays in people's imaginations on the other side of the wall. Um, you know, this is true of adults, but it's especially true of children. Um, and kids who have been born in the years since the Second Intifada, since the erection of the wall, who have grown up within sight of the sea, um, but can never visit it, and most have never visited it. Um, and they talk about it all the time, and they dream about it, and they think about it, and it just plays an, an enormous role um, in, their, in their imaginations and their emotions. All week, Nariman said, Abu Yazin had been talking about nothing but the coastal city of Acre, and the sea. He had never seen the open water, never swam in it, never heard the rhythms of the waves rolling in. In school, his class, he studied Acre with its ancient citadel and old crusader walls rising from the blue Mediterranean. Abu Yazin wanted to dive from their heights into the water below. He had seen photos, had heard his mother sing Acre's praises. You haven't lived, she told me once, until you've seen Acre. It was barely a couple of hours' drive away, but it had been 15 years since she and Bassem had been able to cross into Israel to make the trip. Before that, they had only been there once, in the first year of their marriage, with Bushra and Naji. We all just cried, Nariman said, at the beauty of the places that had been lost to them. But it was Ramadan, and every Friday, the Israeli authorities were allowing some West Bank Palestinians women and girls, plus men over 40 and boys under 17, to cross through Kalandia checkpoint into Jerusalem to pray at the Al-Aqsa. I met the Tamimis near the East Jerusalem bus station with three Israeli friends. The kids were almost frantic with excitement. They had skipped the mosque and that week's demonstration in the village. We were going to the beach. Ahed withdrew into her iPhone as soon as we got in the car but her little brother's eyes took in every vehicle we passed and every detail of the landscape, much tamer here than in the rocky hills of the West Bank. I could almost hear Abu Yazan's brain buzzing from the back seat. He asked his mother if it was true that Napoleon couldn't conquer Acre because the city's fortifications were so strong. She told him that it was. Then how did the Jews take it? He asked. They didn't, Nariman said. I don't understand how we just gave it away. The highway widened to six lanes. Hey, Abu Yazan yelled. I see the sea. He didn't really. We were still miles from the coast. Abu Yazan spotted a sign for the turnoff to Nazareth. Is there a sea in Nazareth? He asked. We passed the domed concrete silos of a power plant, and then Haifa was in front of us. Not the sea yet but the shipyards and the train yards and the rear slope of Mount Carmel. Then there it was, the sea, big and blue between the buildings of the port. Everyone was quiet. How beautiful our country is, said Nariman. This isn't our country, said Abu Yazan. Then whose is it? It's the army's country, 
he said. But the kids would have to wait. We went first to the Baha'i Gardens with their palm trees and groomed hedges and flowers spilling in terraced cascades down the western slope of Mount Carmel. Wad took photos of the flowers. Abu Yazan climbed everything that could be climbed. The sea gleamed beneath us in the distance. We headed for the cars, but Bassam wanted to, ha wanted to drop in on a friend. This was too much for Abu Yazan. He couldn't wait another moment. He howled and made a break for it, running into traffic. I darted after him and carried him squirming to the car. Eventually, we drove north to Acre. Abu Yazan raced up the stone steps of the seawall, scrambled over the rocks beyond the guardrail, and leaned out over the edge to watch the surf crash in below. I had to catch him by his shirt. We walked beneath the ancient arches of the old city and through its narrow alleys. It was 95 degrees and humid. The children ran screaming through the streets, splashing one another with bottled water, their shouts echoing off the thick stone walls. We watched the local kids jump from the seawall into the water 30 feet below. Wad and Abu Yazan peeled off their shirts and dared each other to make the leap, but in the end they didn't do it, which was just as well, because neither of them could swim. It was nearly six by the time we made it to the beach. The sun was still hot. It wasn't much of a beach, just a narrow strip of shore wedged between a row of, of four-story Soviet-style apartment blocks and the sea. The sand was flecked with colorful shreds and shards of plastic, surf-degraded shopping bags, and random junk in blue and green and pink. Before I stepped out of the car, the kids had bolted for the water. Bassam sat in the shallows and let the waves tickle his bare feet. Neriman lay on a blanket with the others. Abu Yazan, who had waded to the far end of the beach, was screaming. A fish, he yelled. A fish! I swam over, expecting whatever it was to be long gone by the time I reached him, but the fish was still there, about six inches long, and very dead, lolling with the current. Abu Yazan reached to grab it, got scared, and pulled his hand back. I told him not to touch it, but Salam waited over, picked it up with a drifting shred of plastic bag, and ran off to show his mother, swinging the fish by the tail. The sun sank, and the water turned white, and then gold, and then gray and flat, as the sun disappeared behind the clouds. Bassam and Nariman walked alone down the shore. I had never seen them hold hands before. The sun was gone. Everyone else on the beach had left. The kids were in the water, shrieking and splashing and paddling about. It was dark by the time they slumped back to the cars, wet towels on their pale, skinny shoulders, shivering a little and smiling still. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. That was beautiful and painful. I'd like to open it for uh, questions from the floor. Um, if you have any questions already formulated, if you can see hands, and we'll take three questions at a time and allow them to answer them, and then we'll see if you have time for two or three rounds. Yes, I'll give you this mic. If you could just please say your first name. Sure. Hello. <coughs> um, I had a question. But also a comment. When you were talking about the balance issue, I thought you spoke really beautifully, and it actually sounded to me a lot like the pro-Israel establishment in the U.S., not not Israel. When you were describing it, like this kind of like amazing industrial complex. Um, so I'm wondering if you know now that you've written this book, if you feel like it will can or will have any effect in the U.S. And being that you live there now, and if you think any of the politics of the election you know, in like America's stance via Israel-Palestine in general, if that's something that you think this book, and in general, do you see there being any kind of change in that discourse? I want to go back to your uh, original intention of understanding resistance, and wondered if you could speak about what you 
have discovered in all these experiences and stories. And the second part, the second question is, is this resistance enough? I'm Daniela. Um, can you talk about your work methods? Like, did you live with families in their homes? Did you rent an apartment in Hebron? And do you speak Arabic? Okay. Um, um, <laughs> you know, I guess the first question: Do I, can I hope it, it will have any effect? Um, I think I've learned. You know, after many years of working as a journalist, engaged with you know, uh, with politics, for lack of a, a better term, um, if one hopes for a direct effect, uh, one's heart is, is constantly broken, and one constantly feels inadequate, and insufficient, and um, and useless, and one you know despairs completely. Um, so I certainly don't hope for any any um, immediate or or kind of measurable um, change. Um, I do hope in, I don't know if this is a smaller way or a larger way, uh, that the book will, will reach people's hearts in a way that, um, that they haven't been reached in the U.S. Um, you know, I think uh, the discourse is and has been quite shut down, um, and which is one of the things that motivated me to write this book, um, that spending time in the West Bank. Uh, I constantly saw things that, you know, as well read as I was, and I, I, I tried to be, you know, to read everything I could before I, you know, the first time I started reporting there, I constantly saw things I wasn't prepared for, and that, and that you know, I, I knew that most Americans knew nothing about. Um, and, and some of that was sort of factual things, um, some of that were the, the, the kind of deep absurdities of the occupation, which we don't always have a sense of uh, from outside. Um, but a lot of it were the kind of small human things. And I think that so much work goes into demonizing and otherizing Palestinians um, that it takes an extraordinary amount of work to, for Americans to remember that this occupation involves actual human beings um, who are as, as complex as, as human beings anywhere and, and who have uh, you know, the same longings as, as, as anyone does. Um, so if, you know, if I can open up some tiny windows in people's, in people's minds and in their hearts um, so that when they read the headlines um, and, you know, about and see some number of Palestinians that were killed in one operation or another, um, that make them realize that those, those are not just numbers, then that, that, that to me would be a real accomplishment. Um, the other part of your question about um, the state of things in the U.S., um, you know, uh, to anyone who's been following the election generally, the state of things is dreadful. Uh, <laughs> but I think um, in a small but really concrete way, I do feel optimistic that the discourse around Israel and Palestine is changing and opening up. Um, I think the fact that this book was published, the fact that this book came out of a New York Times Magazine story, the New York Times Magazine was willing to sign a story about Nabi Salah, um, is pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, the fact that, like, has gotten reviewed you know, in, in large newspapers in the States. I was ready for it to be ignored mm -hmm. um, because that's what usually happens to, to folks that are sympathetic to, to Palestinians in the U.S. Um, and then, you know, I did a bunch of traveling around the U.S. Um, to talk about the book in, over the summer and was pretty astounded everywhere I went at people's hunger to really talk about this. And you know, some of them were people who were active Palestine solidarity people. A lot of them were not. Were people who were you know completely new to these issues, um, but were moved by them and had a, a pretty deep understanding that they weren't getting the <laughs> truth. Um, and I also took hope. From, you know, it was really small, but the fact that like Bernie Sanders said these outrageously radical things, um, you know, on the floor of the Democratic convention such as no solution can be found to this conflict unless Palestinian rights and dignity are taken seriously. Like, wow, right, you know? Um, and, and, you know, he took heat for this. Uh, you know, the, the Democratic establishment called him an extremist for saying this completely common sense thing, because that's how it closed down the, you know, the conversation has been. Um, but the fact that he said it meant to me not that Sanders was, um, 
you know, this brilliant and courageous politician, but that Sanders had read his polls, um, and that Sanders understood his constituency, um, and understood that more and more Americans agreed with this, and that if he said this, and if he spoke out for, for Palestinian rights in a national forum, he would be attacked, but he would also have, he would, you know, he would have people behind him, um, and his core constituency would not be alienated. And that's a big change. Um, and, you know, we're not going to see any, anything different out of either of the two candidates at all. Um, you know, there's no reason at all to hope that in the next four or even eight years there's going to be any real shift in, in U.S. policy. Um, but I think in a, in a slow kind of glacial way, um, things are, are actually changing. Um, okay, uh, at the back, the question about resistance. Uh, what have I discovered? Um, well, um, I describe it in 360 pages, um, and it's for sale. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know exactly how to sum it up. Uh, I mean, I think it's it's one of the nice things about being a writer is that you have a question um, that torments you, and you can answer it in a really like long-winded and complicated way um, for yourself, and hopefully other people will want to read it too. Um, I guess the only thing I, I can say that might be a slightly more satisfying answer than that one is, um, I think when I started writing about this and reporting um, on this, I probably, I certainly had more um, of the romantic in me than I had now. Um, and I think, you know, the book basically traces, it, it starts roughly in 2011 when I first uh, started working here, but the bulk of the book takes place over the year that I lived here, which was a, a very, um, you know, a hard year, a year that culminated in the Gaza War of the summer of 2014. Um, and uh, that certainly shook uh, any of the romantic out of me. Um, but I think what it taught me um, was that Hope and despair are not uh, two separate things. They are not um, opposites at all, but they are related dialectically and often coexist uh, within the same people, within the same moment. Um, and I think that's extremely important and meaningful for uh, any understanding of resistance. Um, when resistance involves as, uh, as difficult objective as, um, as the one this book is about. Um, is this resistance enough? Um, no. <laughs> I guess that's the, the simple answer. <laughs> um, uh, Daniela's questions about my methods. Um, so the the earliest part of the reporting from Nabi Saleh came from um, a period of living um, in the house of Basim and Naim um, for several weeks. After that, most of the reporting I was based in Ramallah. Um, the, there's a, a long section of the book that's based in Hebron. Um, I was um, living there for, for about a month, um, camped out in someone's sitting room um, on Shahada Street. Um, there are sections of the book, uh, a chapter towards the end about the village of Mokher, in the South Hebron Hills, um, which just this last week suffered its uh, second set of demolitions this month and its third set of demolitions this year. Um, and that's a place that I first visited in 2011 and visited uh, repeatedly and then ended up um, going to in the, I guess it was the spring of 2014 and staying for a while as well. Um, so, uh, you know, some of these places are places I would visit for for a day that I wrote about, most of them are places that I spent pretty extended amounts of time in. Um, my Arabic is, uh, uh, was crappy when I was here, and it's, it's worse now. Um, <laughs> it's be worse now. Right, we have time for another round of questions. Hi, my name is Dan. Um, you talked in your introduction about a romantic book, but a clear-eyed book. So I'd love to hear what's what's the difference. What's what's what in your book is a clear-eyed view? Uh, and, and along those lines, um, to what extent does your book deal not only with 
the injustices of the Israeli occupation, but the deep disappointment that many Palestinians have in their own political parties and governmental institutions. Hi, um, my name is Anwar. Um, you've mentioned that you've lived in Ramallah for a while, and um, the kind of resistance that you see in Ramallah is completely different than the one that you see in Nabi Saleh, if you would like to call that the one in Ramallah actual resistance. But um, within the political claims of the government, the kind of normal life that is taking place in Ramallah right now, the kind of construction, um, whether it's commercial construction or um, governmental construction, is kind of resistance. So um, being in that kind of environment, living, and then commuting to Nabi Saleh and seeing another kind of resistance each Friday, what are your insights? Thank you. Um, the, um, the difference between being remote and clear eyed. Uh, you know, there is this romantic narrative about Palestinian resistance, which we see in a lot of you know, leftist accounts. And um, it's not false, it just leaves a lot out. Um, and it leaves out that you know the people involved are are humans who have failings and, and who despair, um, and that wasn't something I wanted to leave out. Um, so, um, but I, I don't think I did. I think uh, I, I hope that the characters that I write about come off as as, as complex human beings. Um, I think they certainly come off as, as human beings who are constantly struggling with doubts about what they're doing. And, and, and elsewhere, you know, their sacrifices were were real and they and constant, um, and the, their awareness of what they were potentially sacrificing was enormous. You know, their own lives, their own freedom, their children's lives, their children's freedom, um, and these weren't decisions that anyone took lightly. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I, guess, I guess the difference is between you know that romantic image of of like the little girl shaking her her fist at the soldier. And knowing how much you know, absolute misery um, that image came out of and came along with um, for her, for her, for her family, um, you know, and, and the sort of uh, the ripples of, of trauma that, 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 that went along with that. Um, and do I deal with uh, the disappointment of Palestinians in, in their own uh, governing institutions? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't think it's it's possible to you know, write honestly about. The situation in the West Bank, without writing about people's um, attitudes towards the PA, which are incredibly complex. Um, you know, people are you know deeply disappointed. Uh, you know, certainly this week, as as much as any, with uh, the events in Nablus this week, people are, are disgusted and angry. Um, but you know, many people also draw their paychecks from the PA. Brothers and fathers and cousins who are in the PA security forces. Um, so people have very complex relationships to it. Um, um, and then on the question of uh, resistance in Ramallah, there's a chapter in the book about Rawabi, um, uh, which deals precisely with that kind of uh, you know sort of uh, commercial. Uh, re you know, this is something that gets billed as resistance in, in, in like the Wall Street Journal. Um, but that is not really understood as such, I think, by, by most people uh, around here. Um, yeah, there was always a disconnect for me between going back and forth between Ramallah and um, other parts of the West Bank. Um, you know, there was always a disconnect between going back and forth between Ramallah and, and Jer uh, Jerusalem, certainly. Um, but even traveling in the West Bank, there's a deep disconnect between, you know, between Hebron and Ramallah. There's, a, there's an enormous change between, you know, any small village, Nabi Saleh. <coughs> where there are coffee shops where, you know, um, you can spend 20 shekels on a cup of coffee um, and seeing how people are living everywhere else. Um, that said, I think um, it's easy to tar Ramallah with all with the same brush. Um, but, you know, a lot of the activists who came to Nabi Saleh every week lived in Ramallah. Um, and um, Ramallah resistance didn't just mean that kind of uh, hyped 
commercial, um, I don't want to call it resistance because it's acquiescence, and, uh, you know, um, but, uh, but it also meant like, you know, the guys in the camps um, in, in, in Jelazon and Al Amri in, in Rwanda um, who are you know, being um, resisting in the way that people are in the camps all over in West Bank and in, in Shafat and, and are, are suffering the same kinds of uh, um, consequences and, and, and sacrifices because of it. Uh, you know, in the, um, in the summer of 2014, after the, um, the kidnapping of the, of the three boys when um, Israeli troops were flooding the West Bank and were entering Ramallah every night, um, you know, it, it was the guys in the camps who were the only ones putting up any, any kind of nominal resistance at all. Um, and there were clashes almost every, every night, every time the Israelis came into, came into the city. So I don't I don't want to um, I don't want to damn all of Ramallah um, because uh, it's a complicated place. Ben, I'm going to ask you to read one more paragraph for us uh, as a closing, and before doing so, I want you to reflect. You're a fiction writer. You have wrote two novels before, and I think reading your first piece, we could see how the style is kind of coming through to from fiction to non-fiction. So a bit of reflection on how that has uh, been for you moving from non a fiction to non-fiction and you, you know we understand that Palestine now it's the reality is almost fiction anyway so it's probably easier to do that but could you please reflect on this and close for us with another piece? Um, sure, maybe I'll, um, I'll close on the piece and uh, I'll, I'll set it up a little bit by saying a lot of what happens here if I wrote about it as a fiction writer like nobody would believe it. It's like it's too heavy-handed. Like the ironies are just sort of too obvious, um, and it, it would seem you know people would demand more subtlety from me as a fiction writer if I try, if I made up some of these scenes of things that actually happened. Um, but I'll say also, you know, um, I think I've been lucky in the, like my nonfiction and fiction writing kind of have get to um, each one kind of gives me different things. I think and. Being a fiction writer, I think, allows you, or perhaps trains you, to notice small details that you wouldn't necessarily notice as a journalist, as a journalist purely, um, and to, know, to kind of, hopefully, to learn how to tell stories um, in more complicated and subtle ways through those details, through the accretion, accretion of kind of details and, and, and um, changes in character and, and, and setting and things like this. Um, that. Uh, Simply as a journalist, you don't necessarily learn how to do that stuff. So uh, I, I hope that uh, you know that gives this this book a um, allows people um, to sort of feel themselves more deeply in an environment um, than they would otherwise, and allows them, therefore, I hope, uh, to feel a greater empathy um, for for the people that I'm writing about than than they would be able to otherwise. Um, so I'll read. Um, a section from the Hebron um, chapters of the book. Um, I don't know how much I have to tell people here. In the US, I have to give a lot of background to everything. Um, but I'm going to assume that everyone knows that you know, Hebron is the only city in the West Bank with a, a settler presence within it, and therefore the only city in the West Bank um, with a substantial presence of, of Israeli soldiers within it. And this means that Hebron has been sliced up into these kind of uh, impossible little pieces, um, all of which have different rules, some of which um, Palestinians are allowed to drive in but not walk, some of which Palestinians are not allowed to walk at all, um, and sort of checkpoints everywhere and kind of invisible barriers everywhere, even though there are checkpoints. Um, and this story, the, the place that I was staying in, uh, in Hebron while I was there, was right across from Beit Hadassah. One of the places that settlers live in in, in Hebron, um, and it's on Shuhada Street, and it marks it was the last house in which Palestinians could live and walk um, on Shuhada Street. Um, so if I walked out the door, there was a soldier waiting there, um, and even when I'd been there a month, he still asked me for my passport every day. And um, but you know he would look at my passport and then he'd say go. Uh, but the family that lived in the house knew that they couldn't shouldn't even bother trying to walk past him. They could only turn to the left while I could turn in either direction. Um, so this is all about uh, something that happened across the street from where I was staying. 
Just outside the old gold market, now the rubbish market, a heavy man named Abdul Khalik Seder had invited us in for tea. He took us first to his roof. None of it was visible from the market below, but from the rooftop it was possible to see that Seder's house was right next to Beit Adasa and across the street from the Sharabatis, which was where I was living. It was a perilous location. Soldiers had welded shut not only the Seder's door to Shihada Street, but all their windows facing south. The other windows were blocked by the same thick screens that covered every vulnerable aperture of every inhabited Palestinian dwelling in H2, which is the uh, part of Hebron um, controlled by the Israeli military. All the time they throw stones, Seder said of the settlers. If I say good morning, they say Sharmuta. He smiled grimly and told a few stories. Nothing extreme, the kind I would hear in almost every house I visited in Hebron, every Palestinian house, that is. A month and a half earlier, Seder said, the soldiers claimed a child had thrown stones from his roof. They came in to search the house, shoved his brother's four-year-old daughter, and when he became angry, they beat him. They ended up breaking his arm. A few months later, after I left the city, I found a link to a video shot by Abdul Khalik's brother, Shadi. The incident it recorded was not anything out of the ordinary. It was, in the local parlance, normal. But it managed to capture a great deal in a few short minutes, not just about Hebron, but about the whole sad comedy in which everyone was caught. The video began with a settler appearing on the edge of the Seder's roof, which was protected from its neighbors with a fence and a single coil of razor wire. A Palestinian flag flew from a low pole on the corner closest to Beit Adassa. The settler, a thin bearded man in a white shirt and a wide white skull cap, had climbed up from the adjacent rooftop. He was clinging to the fence and appeared to be struggling. Why are you coming onto my roof? Shadi asked. The settler announced, the settler answered in a stilted Hebrew accented heavily with Russian. Just to take down the flag, he said coolly, as if he'd come to fix the cable. Shadi repeated his question in a Hebrew that was equally stilted and heavily accented with Arabic. Okay, said the settler, who appeared to be stuck. I won't come over. I just want to talk to you. The entrance is over there said Shadi, come through there. The settler asked for the flag. He even said, please. Voices echoed up from below, egging him on. Take the flag, the camera panned. Dozens of settlers had gathered behind Beit Adassa. Some were shouting and making obscene gestures. Film this, you son of a whore, one yelled. The settler, it was now clear, was standing on top of the ladder, fully snarled in the razor wire, unable to go up or to go down. Shani reached out to untangle him. It's okay, he said. Let me help you. You are welcome. Another settler standing at the base of the ladder yelled up, don't touch him. Shani pulled his hand back. The settler wanted to talk. He was earnest and composed as if he and Shadi Seder had casually struck up a conversation while standing in line at the post office and had raced past the small talk to what really irked them. He objected to the flag again. He thought it was Jordanian, or more likely he knew exactly what it was, but he couldn't bring himself to say the word Palestinian. You live in Israel, he said, not in Jordan. It wasn't an issue Shadi seemed interested in pursuing. What if I came onto your roof, he asked, and took down an Israeli flag? Would that be good? The settler thought about it. He shrugged. He even said sorry. Then he appeared to reconsider. This roof is mine, he said. It is all mine. The whole country is mine. He was still stuck, still tangled in razor wire. He couldn't advance, but he couldn't back down either. He couldn't move at all without tearing his own flesh, but he was sure of himself and apparently oblivious to the precariousness of his position. A soldier had arrived and begun yelling up a shaddy in Arabic, ordering him to go back inside the house. The settler kept talking. This is the land of Israel, he insisted. This is my country, and everything that is here is mine. Thank you very much, Ben. I have to say on the note of uh, 
the book being published. It is probably the first uh, book on Palestine that published by mainstream uh, British and mainstream American publisher that had Palestine on the title. It's actually on the subtitle, but it's uh, beforehand to have to use Palestine or Ramallah or, or some other word or Palestinian territory. So, so that certainly is a change in our publishing, which I hope will continue forward. Thank you very much. We wish you success in your future endeavor and wish the book uh, long life and uh, long distribution uh, around the world. Thank you for coming. Thanks for Dr. Tafel for hosting us. The book is on sale and we're going to be on in Monday evening on Ramallah uh, doing pretty much the same with Ramallah audience. If you have any friends or you'd like to hear us again, you're very welcome. Thank you again. Have a nice evening. Thanks. Thank you.